Uh, we're in Genesis. Back in Genesis, we started this series a few weeks ago uh, talking about the gospel in Genesis. And remember, we had two goals in this uh, just to keep reminding you because I want this to be in your head, right? Our first goal is that God has been really uh, revealing the same plan of salvation since the beginning that Jesus Christ himself said that all of Scripture testifies about me. So what we, when we read the Scriptures, it's not that we're looking or trying to interject Christ into it but we're already assured that everything that we read has something to do with the person and work of Christ uh, uh, ultimately uh, in the Bible. And so this is encouraging for us that God tells us the same things from the beginning to the end. And then secondly, uh, what I want to convey to you or what we're trying to build up in this uh, is that uh, what you're holding in your hands right now is in fact the complete and final revelation of God in his word, his Bible. I want you to understand that. That what can be known about the creator of the universe and his salvation can clearly be seen and understood through his word. Remembering that, that the Bible is not God's interpretation, or I'm sorry, the Bible is not man's interpretation of God. Do we understand that? The Bible is God's revelation of himself to the world. So it is literally uh, the Word of God. Don't get into all of that fallacy about, oh, how God used men to write the Word of God down. So ultimately the Word of God is really just the Word of men. That's not true at all. Okay? And we'll talk about what that means as we go on this morning. Uh, in other words, what we're saying is that you have the actual Word of God in your hand and it is reliable. Listen to what Peter says to get us started this morning. He says, but know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy, and on the word prophecy, don't get hung up on that, okay? Just to remind you, Old Testament, when they think about prophecy, it's not simply about telling the future. Prophecy is simply the word for preaching. That's it. They preached in the Old Testament, and whether it had uh, an effect on the future or not, or revealed something about the future or not was irrelevant. It was simply just preaching. So one's own interpretation for no prophecy or preaching was ever made by an act of human will. He says, but men moved by the Holy Spirit... Uh, the word there, move, Pharaoh, very good word. They were carried along. It actually uses the, uh, it gives us the idea of sails on a ship. The wind carries those sails on a ship and it guides that ship or blows the ship where it will. And so uh, it was never made by an act of human will, but men moved along by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And you see that through all the Old Testament. If you ever just read your Bible, it's going to change the way you think about everything. Right? We have this thing. Oh, well, how can the Bible be true? Because it was handed down by verbal tradition, which is simply not true. From the very beginning, Genesis chapter 5, it says, and they wrote it down. And God talked to Isaiah and he said, write this down. And he talked to Ezekiel and he said, write this down. Write this down. Even in our own study uh, this morning in uh, Genesis 6 through 9, we're talking about Noah and his flood. You have to remember, Adam lived all the way until Noah. Noah's father was 65 years old. That's a thousand years. Okay? So it isn't like somebody said, hey, it's not like the, the game telephone. You remember that game? Okay? They passed it on. There, there, there was not by verbal tradition. They passed it on by what? The Word of God. God always made sure that they wrote it down. Okay? And so don't get it in your head that this is some kind of rumor that just happened to pass through the years, right? It's actually the words of God. Now, it might sound funny. It might sound funny to us that we would have to say to Christians that the Bible is truthful and reliable, that, right, that the Bible is literally the word of God. But the truth is that the truth of it is, is there's a significant element uh, in our churches today uh, that do not hold uh, to a biblical account, like say we've been talking about for the last few weeks of a literal six days of creation, right? That there is literally this pseudo-Christianity out there that even denies that there was a, a, a flood, 
okay? And so we have to talk about these things, right? And it's not just because they believe the science, right? Uh, or they trust uh, the testimony of science over the testimony of God. It's because they believe that. It's also because they believe that whatever happened in Genesis, whether it was a literal six days of creation or whether it was an actual flood or not, is irrelevant to them. They think, if I just believe in the cross of Christ, what does it matter whether those events really happened or not? But the truth is, all of it matters because the Bible is either all truth or none of it is truth. Do you understand? If it is literally and truly the word of God, you can't have God lying to you in one section of the Bible, but telling you the truth in the end. And we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, right? Uh, definitely, if you're going to if you're going to begin to compromise the scriptures in the beginning, then it won't be very long before you begin to compromise the scriptures at the end of the Bible, right? Because what you believe about the beginning, and this is what we've been saying since the beginning of the study, what you believe about the beginning is going to dictate what you believe about the future. Uh, one of the other things that the pseudo church never considers or pseudo Christianity never considers is the fact that it was Jesus himself who literally made it clear that Noah and the flood was an actual historical event. Nobody ever thinks about that. We talk about, well, Jesus said, right? Well, well, uh, how could Jesus know? It was 2,000 years later. Because Jesus is God in the flesh and he knows all things, the beginning from the end. And so when he says it's a literal historical event, we can take that to the bank. Here's what he said. He said, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like in the days of Noah, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and given to marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them away. So will the coming of, son, so will the, coming of the Son of Man be. In other words... If the end of the world will be like the days of Noah, then it's imperative that we just don't disregard events like the flood in Genesis. It does matter, okay? It makes a difference whether it is the truth or not. And so we want to hold fast uh, to that truth because what we believe about the beginning will ultimately dictate what we believe about the future, okay? Remember, Jesus said, if I told you, listen to this, he says, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, then how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things, right? I described for you what happened in the days of Noah. And if you don't believe that, then how are you ever going to believe when I describe to you what happened at the cross? Okay. And so we want to be very, very careful with these things. In fact, one of the things you're going to hear, and I, and I go through a few of these things this morning, one of the things you're going to hear out there in the world a lot by doctors and philosophers and scientists and blah, 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 they're going to come to you and they're going to say, well, uh, I hate to hurt your feelings, but every ancient civilization throughout the history of man has had some form of a flood story. I love when they tell me this too. They all have a version of the flood story. Some of them vary in different ways, but every, every civilization around the whole world, we have found evidence where they have a similar flood story to the one in the Bible. And I said, yeah, isn't that the most fantastic thing in the world? Because I'll tell you why. Because before all the nations were dispersed, before God confused their language, they were all in one place in Genesis 11. And it was the Tower of Babel. Remember, they had all gathered to one place and they'd all set themselves up against God. And God said, if I leave them like this, they're going to be able to accomplish anything. Or more importantly, they're going to destroy their selves, right? Before my son can come into the world and rescue them from their sin. And so it says that God confused their languages and this is the beginning of the table of nations. This is where everybody spreads out to the world. Well, guess what they knew when they were at the Tower of Babel? They knew about the flood because they were only a few hundred years removed from it, trust me. And so every nation had a version of the flood, right? Every nation had a version of the flood. And I think it's great because if it was just a singular event that was made up by Christianity, then we would have reason to doubt, wouldn't we? But as I said in the last few weeks, right, it doesn't matter how much empirical evidence we present to the world because men do not 
believe men aren't saved by trusting in empirical evidence. Men are saved by what? Hearing and hearing the words of Christ. Men are saved by believing and trusting and responding uh, to the word of God. That's how they're saved. It doesn't, I don't care how convincing you are in this world. If you leave the wisdom of God out, if you leave the word of God out of your testimony, the people that you are testifying to literally have zero hope because God will not save apart from his word. Do you understand? And so it's nice that we talk about these things, these evidences, because it helps you to understand that we are in a blind faith, right? We're not blind following Christ blindly. We have a reasoned faith, okay? And it is reasonable when God tells us these things uh, that they are true. We don't have to try to guess, But sadly, right, the world and many that claim to know Christ uh, are still denying that the Word of God is infallible and uh, complete, okay? And this isn't a surprise to us. One of the things I love about Scripture is it's always telling us things that are true, that are practical, right? We're not surprised that the world uh, denies the flood. We're not surprised when so-called Christianity uh, denies the flood account in Genesis, right? Uh, Because the Bible tells us uh, that there will be those, despite what the word of God says, who will refuse to believe the book of Genesis. Listen to what Peter says, and I want you to see this, and then we'll pray, and we'll go into our text this morning. He says, know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers, right, the word scoff, that scoffers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And really that's what Peter's addressing here. He's really addressing Genesis chapter six through nine, the flood. And then he says, Next one, there we go. But by his word, by Christ's word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. And so he says, look, they keep denying everything that happened in the beginning, but here is the faithfulness of God that the destruction that is coming will not be by flood, but it will be by fire and it should uh, be believed, right? Don't you see what we believe about the past dictates what we believe about the future? because those people that Peter is addressing, they're not only denying what happened in the beginning, but they're saying, where is your God? Where is he? If he's really coming, then where is he? They're also denying what? They're also denying the future, okay? And so we don't want to be those people because it's like Jesus told us that in the days of Noah, they were what? They were having a party, weren't they? Look at that dumb Noah building that ark. He doesn't know that there's a rave party downtown that everybody's attending tonight, okay? And Jesus says they were that way until what? The rains came, okay? They were that way until the rains came. So the truth is the is, uh, the same for our future. But let me pray this morning. We're gonna begin to look at Genesis 6 as we look at the flood. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, just being able to look at your word and... Be encouraged this morning, not only by those things that are true, Father, those things that we can see and touch, but also uh, by those things that we have faith in by the word of God, trusting uh, in Christ as our Lord and Savior, Uh, the same way that Noah trusted in you in the past, Lord. Uh, to be spared or to be saved or rescued from the judgment, Father God. This is where we are today, that by faith we are putting our trust in Christ, that he uh, paid the penalty for our sin, and there is no more wrath for us in the future. And so, Lord, let that be true for us this morning. I am so praying, Lord, for everyone here uh, that they would hear these words and they would not become scoffers. They wouldn't roll their eyes or doubt or say, it really doesn't matter because it does matter, Lord. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would work in them, work in us this morning, uh, that we might be not just uh, believe your word, but that we be comforted by your word, Lord, that we would uh, know that we have this security, that you are a loving God by nature, that you are a saving God by nature, and that your desire is that no one would perish if we would just listen and respond. And so we thank you, Jesus, for everything you're going to teach us this morning. We pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. Now, we're not going to get through all of this this morning. 
In fact, I got to turn to Genesis 6 here. We're not going to get through all of this this morning, but what I want to do is I want to start out with just reading the Word of God. I want to start out at looking uh, at the facts of the flood uh, in our verses this morning. And then next week, we're going to talk about why that's significant, how that points to Christ, how that declares his salvation. Some of it we'll cover this morning, some of it we'll cover next week, right? But the whole point is, is that we're just not going to make it through everything, so there will be another part to this. And so we want to be mindful of those things. Um, And the first thing that I want you to notice as we get into chapter 6, that's where we are this morning, Genesis chapter 6. First thing I want you to notice uh, as we get into chapter 6, right, is that the sin of Adam is still very much alive in the days of Noah, okay? We, remember, we talked about last week Cain and Abel and how Cain slew his brother and how we talked about those two families that are on earth. Remember, the, the world believes that everyone are children of God, but the Bible is very explicit and says, no, there's two family lines in this world. There is the family line of Satan or the seed of the serpent, and there is the family line of Christ, uh, the seed of the woman. And so, So all of us are born in uh, the line of Satan, right? We're in the seed of the serpent according to the Bible. And so the only way that you and I can go from the family line of Satan to the family line of Christ is by faith in Christ himself and his sacrifice. And so we see those two family lines. We got this family of of Abel who uh, who was slayed by his brother and then eventually comes Seth that carries on that line that goes to Christ. And then we have Cain that goes on down the line of evil, okay? Everybody in Cain's line continues to be evil. Everybody in Cain's line uh, continues to be uh, purposely in opposition to uh, Christ. And so everyone who has ever been born is born uh, in the likeness of Adam, the Bible says. Everyone who has ever been born uh, is condemned from birth and separated from God uh, from birth because you have the sin of Adam in you. It was imputed to you. In fact, this is what Paul says in Romans just to try to help us out. He says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, that's Adam, right? Adam and Eve sin, sin entered the world. He says, and death through sin, right? Death. Uh, the, the wages of sin is death. And so death spread to all men. Now, a lot of us, leave that verse up there, a lot of us will say, well, that's pretty unfair, Pastor Sean, uh, that all of humanity has imputed sin, right? That all of humanity inherited uh, the sin of Adam because it just doesn't seem like that's fair. But the problem with that is, it's not just that we inherited the sin of Adam, it's that we what? What does it say in the last part of that verse? It says that death, right? That death through sin, and so death spread to all men because why? Because all sinned. I've had people object before. They say, well, you know, it's just not fair that sin was imputed to us. Uh, but I'm like, but the problem with that statement is that you what? You sin. You have proven that Adam's uh, nature has been imputed to you because you are a sinner, you are separated from God. And so the point in Genesis 6 is that as man multiplied, right, that's the whole point he's making in the beginning of Genesis 6, that as man multiplied, right, was fruitful and multiplied, so was the sin and evil multiplied as well. Okay, it didn't go away because Abel was killed and and Cain got uh, ostracized to some strange land. Uh, Sin was prevalent in all men. That despite all the hopes and dreams, right, of our um, utopian uh, philosophers of this day, right, you hear it all the time, uh, despite all of their hopes and dreams, the Bible makes it clear that the world is not going to get better, it's only going to get worse. In fact, just to help you out with things, if you think we live in absolutely the worst time ever in the history of the world, uh, that would be false because God tells us in Genesis Six, that this was absolutely the most evil time ever known. Okay, and you say, well, God didn't know what was going to happen today. Well, God knows the beginning from the end. Are you with me? Okay, he's sovereign about all things. So if he says this was the most evil time, you can trust that it was the most evil time. Okay, look at verse five with me. It says, then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil uh, continually. The Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth and he was grieved 
it says, in his heart. And so when, when the Bible says that God was sorry that he made man, this is not an indication uh, that God made a mistake. Are you with me? It is impossible for a sovereign, holy, righteous, all-powerful, all-knowing God to make mistakes. In fact, let me help you out with something else. Our God, it is in, for us to understand that our God, it is impossible for him to change his mind. Do you understand? Okay. If you understand the mechanics of changing your mind, the only reason you would change your mind is if you what? If you made a mistake to begin with, or you made a decision that wasn't the right decision to begin with, but our God never does that. So technically speaking, when you say, is there anything impossible with God? Yes, there is. It's impossible for God to change his mind because he never makes a wrong decision to begin with. It is also impossible for God to lie. Did you know that? Okay, God cannot lie. By nature, he cannot sin. Okay, there's no way for him to do that. It is impossible. So if you want to trick your, your, your Bible friends at your next uh, Bible party, which I'm sure you have all the time, those are a couple questions you can throw into the mix. Yeah, when he says that the guards was sorry that he made man, what he's talking about is that he is relenting, right? He is relenting uh, at the sin and the wickedness of men. He is relenting at the fact um, not only that, that, that men have rejected him, but also that they want to live their life without him. Okay? It's not because God made a mistake. Oh, I'm changing my mind about man. He's not changing his mind about man. How do we know? Because he already told us in scripture that he decided to send Christ into the world to redeem men before he even created the foundations of the world. And so God's not changing his mind. He's just saying, you know what? This is heartbreaking. Uh, And so one of the most heartbreaking things for God is that he knows that his holiness and righteousness demands judgment. Are you with me? Okay. Remember, uh, I think it's in, um, oh man, I can't remember the verse now. I think it's in Ezekiel where he says, God takes no delight in the destruction of the wicked. Okay. And so he's grieved over this. It's not that he made a mistake. He's just grieved. Look at verse seven. It says, the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, from uh, man to animals, to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. And so the story of Noah's ark isn't a happy little story. Do you understand that? See, one of the reasons that there's this pseudo Christianity out there, I firmly believe this, is because for years we've taught Noah's Ark as some kind of fairy tale. If you go in and you look at all the books of Noah's Ark, there are all these little happy animals and and Noah's happy and everybody's happy and they're on this little pudgy boat uh, kind of floating on top of the waves and it's some kind of party. I remember even when I was a kid, probably 1969, 1970, some of you guys might remember, you could go to McDonald's and they would actually give you a gift with a happy meal that was Noah's Ark. Okay? And it was happy little animals, but the story of Noah isn't a happy little story. It is a horror story. Don't you understand? They would have been, it, this wasn't a cruise, right? A 12 month cruise on the ocean uh, for Noah and all the happy animals. You have to remember that they would have been, been uh, subject to seeing millions of carcasses floating on the water for months, okay? It was God literally destroying everything that had the breath of life. And so it wasn't this little happy story. But we need to remember that the story of Noah, the story of Noah's ark is not primarily about the flood itself or the judgment of God, but rather the story of Noah's ark is about his grace. Remember, everything testifies about Christ. It's about his grace and it's about his mercy because no one deserved to be saved. But the story of Noah's Ark is about God saving eight people who didn't deserve to be rescued. Okay, that's the story of us. We don't deserve to be rescued, but God rescues us, right? Remember, all of Scripture in one form or another testifies about Christ or His salvation. And so uh, even though the, the, the whole world was corrupted by the sin of Adam, including Noah and his family, do you understand that? We talked about that last week, Cain and Abel. Cain killed his brother Abel because he was more righteous, but it wasn't because Abel was sinless. 
Abel was in need of a, a savior as well. He wasn't the good guy and Cain was the bad guy. There's no such thing. According to scripture, we're all in opposition to God. We're all in opposition uh, to Christ. And so Noah, right? And his family get saved by the grace of God uh, through the judgment of the flood. Look at verse eight with me. Listen to what it says. Okay, I want you to pay attention to the words. So many conversations I have, or I should say debates, I'll be nice with people that come to me and they're like, oh, you're full of snot, pastor. Uh, this whole six days of creation and this flood thing, uh, science is proven and this. And, uh, so we have these debates and I want you to, I'm like, hey, have you ever read the Bible? And I'm telling you, it's like nine out of 10. It's no exaggeration. They're like, well, no, I've never read it, but I just know what science says. Okay. Man, read the word of God. It'll change the way you see things. Look at verse eight. It says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time, and Noah walked with God, right? Why did Noah uh, find favor with God? It wasn't because he was sinless, okay? It wasn't because Noah was perfectly obedient. Do you get this? By the time we get to chapter nine, we're gonna read, right, that Noah, after he got off of the ark onto dry land, he made some grapes, fermented them, drank the wine, got buck naked, and fell down in his tent, okay? So it wasn't that he was sinless or that he was super righteous. When we talk about righteousness in this context, it is the righteousness of God that is imputed to Noah. Why was it imputed to Noah? Because Noah believed God. He followed, he, 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 he responded uh, to the word of God, okay? And so that's why he declares him. He says, blameless in his time. He says that he walked with God, right? I mean, Romans 3.19, or I'm sorry, Romans 3.10 makes it clear that no one is righteous, not even one, which includes Noah, right? But rather, just like us, Noah and his family were saved from the judgment by the grace of God through faith, right? Noah and his family were spared because they believed and trusted the word of God. In fact, in verse 22, it says right there that what? It says, thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. By the time we get to chapter 7, verse 3, it says, thus uh, Noah did all uh, that the Lord had commanded him. I had a funeral service on Friday. And I talk about this a lot, but it's the truth. Because what you're going to do when you go to these funeral services is you're going to hear a lot of people stand up and say, don't worry about it, we'll see him someday in heaven. No life with Christ, no faith, no nothing, but we're going to see him in heaven. And so I'm the guy that has to stand up there afterwards with the word of God and think, wow, what am I going to say, right? But the thing I like to tell people is, look, there's a vast difference between believing in God and believing God. Do you understand that? There is a huge difference between believing in Christ and believing Christ, okay? Everyone can believe in God, okay? Think about those people that were standing outside the ark when Noah was telling them, hey, look, there's a flood coming uh, and here's the only way to salvation, right? Think about that incident. Uh, you can say, well, I believe in the ark, Okay, but if you don't get in the ark, there is no salvation for you. Do you understand? Okay, you can admire it from a distance and that's what people do. Oh, I believe in God. They admire God from a distance, but they are unwilling to respond to him or respond to his word. And so believing Christ, believing God means that we're actually going to respond to his word. And it says here that Noah was considered righteous because he did all that God had commanded him to do. Obviously not perfect, right? With the whole drunk in the tent incident. Actually, I kind of don't blame Noah. I mean, that was well over a year uh, with a bunch of farm animals. Not to mention your in-laws. Ooh, right? Rough trip. So we have to remember that no one on earth at the time had ever seen rain before. Because you say, well, what did Noah have faith in? No one had ever seen rain before. There certainly wasn't any floods, okay? And I can't go into all the reasons why, but the Bible's pretty explicit about it. 
So what did Noah have faith in that God counted him as righteous? Well, Noah had faith in the fact that the only way that he could be spared from the judgment was to build and to get into this ark. Do you understand? Okay, simple as that. Simple as that. The same way in the New Testament, God tells you, look, the only way you can be spared from the judgment is to be what? In Christ. How do we do that? We simply call on the name of the Lord. Okay? Believing and trusting is fantastic gospel. I love it. The writer of uh, Hebrews tells us this. Listen to the words. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen. What are things not yet seen, right? No rain. God says it's going to rain, right? Next week, we're going to talk about all the ramifications of that. I know some of the other objections in the world are, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. That couldn't flood the world. You're right. That's why the Bible says it wasn't the rain that flooded the world. Okay? But we'll get into that next week. We'll save that one. That's your, uh, what do they call that when you pique somebody's interest? A cliffhanger? So you have to come back next week. You can't miss. Anyway, by faith, Noah, being warned about things not yet seen in reverence, prepared the ark for salvation. No, it's called the ark of salvation. Do you see that? Of his household by which uh, he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, right? He became the heir. of. It wasn't that Noah was righteous himself. He became the heir of righteousness. How did he become the heir of righteousness? Because he believed God and he responded to the word of God. How many more times do I got to say that? Okay. You guys understand how this salvation works. We have no righteousness of our own. The only righteousness we have comes from Christ himself. And so it says there, he became the heir of righteousness, which is according to what? Faith. My gosh, man, what a great gospel we have. And so how did God save Noah, physically save Noah with this ark of salvation? And so I don't know if you guys see these pictures, the way the Bible kind of lays these things out, because uh, the same way uh, that Noah was spared from the judgment by being in the ark, by uh, being spared from the floodwaters is the same way that we in the New Testament are spared from the judgment of God uh, by putting our trust in Christ, by being really physically in Christ. Such a good gospel for us, such a parallel And just as the wrath of God or the judgment of God uh, was meant for Noah and his family, uh, that was meant for Noah and his family was poured out on the ark, right? The judgment of God that was meant for you and me because of our sin, right, was poured out on Christ. He took all of the punishment. He was our substitute, okay? Look at verse 13. Said, then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me and the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. He says, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and you shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. Uh, the length of the ark will be 300 cubits, the breadth 50 cubits, and the height 50 cu- or 30 cubits. And you shall make a window for the ark and finish it uh, to one cubit uh, from the top and set the door of the ark in the side. And you shall make it uh, with lower, second, and third decks. Now, here's the deal. Usually when people uh, argue with me about the veracity of the flood, they try to convince me Um, how do we know what the ark looked like? Well, this is how we know what the ark looked like because God describes it for them in detail. You know what's funny about this? Modern shipbuilders, this is truth. You guys can look it up on the internet. You don't have to believe me. Modern shipbuilders who have examined the dimensions from the Bible for the ark verify that there's only two ratios you can have for a stable vessel, and that's either six to one or eight to one, which the ark falls into. Perfectly built. Well, God built it, so yeah, perfectly built, okay? And so we have all of these things. Like we said, we have this reasoned uh, faith. And so the world isn't 
I mean, the world is going to try to convince you uh, that would have been possible, right? That's one of their deals. They're going to try to convince you that it would have been impossible for all of the animals to fit in the ark. That's what they want to tell you. That's, that's their whole spiel, right? Um, the, but the ark really actually wasn't a boat. It wasn't really even a ship. The ark was actually a box, like a floating box. And I have a picture for you this morning. This is the one that they built in Kentucky to the dimensions that the Bible calls for. And this is really, really accurate. It really is compared to scripture. When it talks about that window that's one cubit above the deck, right? It's very, very accurate. It wasn't like all of these windows. You couldn't have a bunch of windows, of course. Uh, but we talks about all of these particular dimensions. Uh, a cubit, if you guys don't know, in the Old Testament was a measurement between a man's elbow and the top of his finger. So that could vary somewhat depending on the size of the man. But generally speaking, the ark was about 450 feet long. Okay. It was 50 feet high and 75 feet wide. Okay. It was a very large uh, ship. Show me another picture of it real quick. This is another angle of it. This thing is massive. You can see the one meter window atop the cross of the ark. Okay. And then go to the next slide for us. We'll talk about this a little bit. Here's the volume, 1,396,000 cubic feet, gross tonnage, 13,960. Capacity, 522 railroad stock cars, or relatively speaking, 125,280 sheep-sized animals, okay? Now you're thinking, oh, that still doesn't sound big enough to me, okay? But you got to remember, this wasn't a cruise ship. You don't need swimming pools and, and bars and restaurants, right? You don't need any of that. All you need is pure space. But just to help you out this morning, right? Uh, we have to remember that Noah didn't have to fit every animal that was on earth onto the ark. It was only those air-breathing animals, right, that God was going to destroy. Fish and sharks and all those other things. Sharks, much to my dismay, by the way, they were all just fine, right? They could swim and alligators and anything that was amphibious didn't have to be rescued from the earth. And all God had to do was take every animal of its kind. The Bible's very explicit. In fact, look at verse 9 with me. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 19. Look at verse 19. And it says, And every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every kind uh, into the ark uh, to keep them alive with you, and they shall be male and female of the birds after their kind, of the animals after their kind, and every creeping thing uh, of the ground after its kind. Two of every kind will come uh, to you uh, to keep them alive. So very interesting here. It's only animals of their kind. Science right now, biology says there's approximately 19,000 different species that are alive on planet earth today. Okay. And so all Noah needed to do was get two of every species. So even if we took and doubled that number. Let's just be conservative. We're going to take 19,000 and double it. Uh, the most room that Noah needed on the ark was 40,000 animals. And you say, well, what about elephants and giraffes and all of those big animals? One of the other things the Bible alludes to is that God would have used juveniles. Remember, his goal was to repopulate the earth. So he didn't need elephants that were 30 years old. He needed elephants that were what? Three years old. He needed, and you got to remember that I think it's, I might be wrong about this double check me on this. I think it's like 80%. It's really high. 80% of the animals on the earth are about the size of a sheep or smaller. Did you know that? Anyone? And so if it was 40,000 animals on the ark and the ark could hold 125,000 sheep-sized animals, guess what? We got a lot of room, folks. Okay. We got a lot of room. And so we just take God at his word. Like I said, all of these things that I'm telling you this morning uh, aren't going to convince your neighbor that Jesus Christ came to save them, okay? But what it is, is going to help you to begin to understand that we're not just making these things up, that God actually says this uh, in his word. In fact, I had another, oh, that's the slide I have there. Okay, that's good. That's all we need. Um, but again, right, the whole point is not to convince the world all the animals could fit on the ark. I don't want you guys to get into that. I don't want you to go home and call up uh, Aunt Gertrude and start rattling on about uh, how there was 19,000 species on the earth today. It's not going to do you any good. 
We need to speak the word of truth. We need to speak uh, the gospel of Christ to them, right? God is, that's how God is going to save the world. And so the point isn't that all the animals could fit on the ark. The point of Genesis 6 is to tell us uh, that God is a saving God by nature. Do you understand? That's the whole point of Genesis, that he is a saving God by nature, that even though the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was, he was grieved in his heart, he still was not willing that any would perish. Do you understand? So important for us to grasp. Second Peter tells us this. Second Peter 2.5 tells us that, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Okay? And I am convinced the 120 years it took him to build the ark that all Noah did was preach to those people that were standing around and begging them to get on the ark when the time came. I guarantee you. That's all he did. But what does it say happened in the end, right? That they had rejected Christ, that they refused uh, to get on the boat. But just as it was in the days of Noah, right? Mankind is still rejecting the truth of Christ and his salvation. Remember what Jesus said? He said, for in those days, right? For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and they did not understand until the flood came and took them away. Let's look at something real quick as we close this morning. In fact, we'll go to that passage in 2 Peter. If you look with me at 2 Peter, I want you to show you something. Because we can talk about the judgment of God all day Okay, and, and we should. We should talk about sin. We should talk about the judgment of God. But we also need to talk about the grace and the mercy of God as well. And I want you to see something. This is Peter talking about the flood, right? He's, he's, he's expounding on the flood. And so here's what he says. This is Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Are you guys with me? This whole chapter, by the way, is a really interesting chapter if you ever read through it, right? It talks about that Christ's word is true. In fact, Peter in this chapter is doing the same thing that we just did this morning. First of all, we want to talk about the fact that God's word is true. Uh, secondly, right, we want to talk about uh, the fact that Christ is consistent and that he is faithful. He's not only consistent and faithful with his salvation, folks, but he's also consistent and faithful with what? His judgment. Okay? He's not going to relent of his judgment. Do you understand that? I know there's a lot of people in the world that are like, well, I'll just take my chances at the end of the day. I'll stand before Christ and I'll say, hey, look, uh, I didn't really know what I was doing on earth, but now that I'm here, I see that it's real. So uh, how about a break? Well, you know what? You won't even have that conversation because you'll already be condemned to eternal hell without hope of recovery. Okay? I tell people this all the time. There's no conversation you're going to have in heaven with God about your salvation apart from Christ. We talked about that last week. The only thing you're going to be able to plead in front of a holy and righteous God is that you will put your trust in Jesus Christ, his son. And that is the only thing that God will consider. Okay? So look at this. Here's what Peter says in verse 3. He says, know this, first of all. In the last day, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since uh, the fathers fell, all continues as it was from the beginning of creation, right? For when they maintain, he says, listen to this, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice uh, that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water. What did Peter just say? He just said, you know what? The creation account that you read in Genesis is absolutely true. The flood that you read in Genesis is absolutely true. Verse 6, through which the world at the time was destroyed by being flooded with water. Verse 7 
but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Listen to this. The present heavens and the earth are being uh, reserved for fire. I want you to understand this, that when the earth is burned up, it won't be because of men. It won't be because of nuclear weapons. It won't be because of global warming, right? It won't be because uh, cows have gas. Are you with me? Okay, it will be because God has determined a day in which he will destroy the earth by fire. There is a day. He is faithful uh, to his word. That's what Peter's telling us. In fact, down in verse 10, it says, because the Lord will come like a thief and all of the earth and its works will be burned up. Okay, and so that's the promise of God. That is his promise of his faithfulness, not only that he is a saving God by nature, but that he is also the Lord of the judgment. Okay. But look at verse nine. Okay. Let's leave with this one today. Such a good verse. I, I love this stuff. Okay. I don't have any tattoos, but if I was going to get one, it would be like this right here. Okay. It says, the Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Do you see that? When it says 120 years in, in, in the first part of Genesis 6, it's not talking about the lifespan of men. It's, talking, it's not even talking about how long it took Noah to build the ark. Do you understand that? It's talking about the time that God gave the known world at that time to see the truth of the gospel and repent. He is patient with you. He is not slow. It's, you know, when people say, well, where's your God? Where was your God when the tsunamis hit? Where was your God when they burned down the Twin Towers? Where was your God uh, when they burned down all those churches, you know? I said, well, my God's been here all along because the people that ran into the Twin Towers, uh, the people that uh, persecute uh, Christianity, the people that shoot up schools, guess what they're in need of? They're in need of a Savior. And the only way that's going to happen is by the grace and mercy of God. And so God is not slow, but he is patient with you, hoping, hoping, hoping that you will repent and turn to him. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for your words. Thank you for the encouragement we have today. Man, if there's anything I'm praying this morning, Father, it's not just that us as believers would hold fast to the word of truth, the veracity of Bible, the, the, the perspicuity of Scripture, Father God, but that everyone here who doesn't know Christ would, man, be just, they would see the glory of the gospel. They would see uh, the glory of the gospel in the face of Christ, Father God, that they would, they would go home and they would, they would plead with you. They would call on you for this salvation, Father God, and that you would uh, save them. That's the hope. It is. You are so gracious to us. We know that you're slow because all of us should have been dead long before we were ever saved, but you didn't kill us off. You waited around until that we would see uh, the glory of Christ. And we're so thankful for that today. And that's our same hope, the same hope that you would save eight people who were unworthy to be saved of the ark gives us hope that you're going to save us who are unworthy to be saved uh, in the future, Lord, by the promises that you have given us through your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for all these truths this morning. We love you, Lord Jesus. Uh, we pray all these things in your wonderful and precious name. Amen.